But we'll try to get this in in 36 minutes. I'm glad to be here today. Uh, and for those of you that have heard me speak a little bit before, uh, if you hear a few of the same things, I'm apologize up front that you have to hear uh, some of that again. But hopefully I've changed a couple of items up and we'll give you some new information. A little bit about GSP just real quick. And Russ asked me to, to mention this because uh, it was a, uh, an exciting time back in the 1940s and 1950s in aviation. And, uh, the community of the upstate was fortunate enough to have a, an icon in the industry, uh, in the aviation industry at that time, Eddie Rickenbacker, uh, who was the president of Eastern Airlines, uh, come through our uh, great upstate and speak to community leaders at that time. And uh, when he uh, stopped by, the message he sent to the community leaders in the upstate was that if you are going to be successful in aviation in the future, um, if you are going to provide the type of aviation facilities that will attract the uh, incoming jet service that is, is about to occur in the jet era of aviation, you need to build a new airport. You need to build an airport that it can accommodate those types of aircraft uh, in the future and that can be a regional facility uh, for the upstate of South Carolina. Uh, and then embarked uh, in a very diligent way, uh, community leaders from around the upstate, uh, including my current chairman, which many of you I think uh, probably know, Mr. Roger Milliken, uh, from Milliken and Company, uh, started to pursue the development of what you now see today as the Greenville-Spartanburg International Airport. So it goes back a long time in history. It was great collaboration back in the 1940s and 1950s to get the airport in place that we have today. And some of what I'll talk about in the recent events with Southwest Airlines has been another uh, tremendous gathering and uh, uh, support uh, base from the upstate that has allowed that to occur. And I think what it shows is when the upstate really puts its mind to something as it did back in the 40s and 50s about building an airport in the upstate, uh, as they did recently in recruiting Southwest Airlines to the upstate, uh, I think we've shown ourselves that we can do anything we put our minds to in a collaborative way. So with that, I want to touch on a few things this morning. A little bit on the Commission Airport Overview. I'll be giving you a little bit of the long back, uh, long ago history, but I'll touch on a few other things. Touch on some air service items, which I know people are interested in. I'm going to touch on a little bit of what we do from a marketing and air service incentive standpoint, just very briefly to let you know that we as an airport are actually kind of put our money out there in order to attract air service to the upstate. Uh, really want to focus probably most of all on some future uh, terminal development at this point, which is kind of what we've jumped into uh, here as we move forward and, and are very excited about uh, after the Southwest announcement. Not that we're not still excited about Southwest, we are, but now our focus is turning a little bit uh, towards our terminal development. And then uh, hopefully have a few minutes for uh, some Q&A. So a little bit about the commission. Uh, our mission statement, you know, we want to provide the citizens of upstate South Carolina with the safest, most efficient, user-friendly facility in the world. And, and that's going to continue to be our goal, uh, you know, high-level mission and vision for what we want to uh, provide long-term. And, and this is part of, uh, of what we're trying to do in a relook at the terminal facilities we have today and the type of air service and amount of air service that we've provided historically and where we need to be in the future. A little bit about our government model for those that may not uh, know about the Airport Commission and, and how, it, uh, uh, how it was set up. In uh, 19, I think it was 59, uh, through the state legislature of South Carolina, uh, we were created as the Greenville-Spartanburg Airport District, um, and that is a, a district that owns uh, the property that the airport sits on, owns all of the assets of the airport. Uh, and, uh, and through that, an airport commission was established in that legislation back in 1959 known as the Greenville-Spartanburg Airport Commission. That commission is made up of six members. Three of those members are appointed uh, essentially by the legislative delegation of Spartanburg County. Three are appointed by the legislative delegation of Greenville County. Uh, all of those members are then confirmed by the governor uh, and then uh, our commission members for six-year terms at a, at a time. Uh, I have a very long tenure uh, of uh, airport commissioners on my commission. My shortest term uh, commissioner is right now 13 years. My longest term is Mr. Milliken, who has been on the airport commission, uh, commission since its inception, and uh, really in, in 1961 when the airport opened. Uh, and then I have some commissioners in between that are in the 20 years. So a very stable commission, uh, which is a great uh, 
position for me to be able to come into as a, an executive director of an airport because uh, my business a lot of times is not unlike a city manager or a county manager. Uh, sometimes airports get pretty political, uh, and when you have political changes, uh, so does the leader of the organization change at those times. So it's nice to have a very stable organization like we have at GSP. Um, I do lead the organization uh, from an administrative standpoint. We have a staff, uh, about 90 full-time staff, and uh, total, I think we're at uh, full-time equivalent staff. We have uh, about a total of about 100 employees, uh, part-time and full-time folks. Uh, and we are expanding some of that as, as we're looking forward to growth. Uh, we're not going to grow significantly from a staff perspective, but we will be adding a few positions uh, as we move into next year and the following year in order to help us with some of our programs. Uh, we're ideally located. Many of you that have flown out of GSP, uh, you know, again, we're 20 minutes from downtown Greenville, 25 minutes from downtown Spartanburg, uh, 50 minutes from Anderson. So well located, easily accessible off I-85, uh, and one of the most beautiful entrances to an airport that you can come into in the country. Uh, if you've been to the airport, uh, I'm very proud of that, and, and I know everybody before me and, and my current commission is very proud of that uh, landscape uh, that is there today because it is a beautiful facility. Um, just an aerial shot uh, of the airport, and, and really if you looked at this, and, and it's a little hard to see on here just uh, because of the lighting, uh, you'll see that there is a large amount of the airport property that is undeveloped today. Um, and not that we want to develop every inch, not that we want to pour concrete everywhere on the airport, but we have some great opportunities going forward, which I'll talk about more towards the end of my uh, presentation about what uh, we think the future holds in doing some aviation and non-aviation development on the airport as we move ahead. Uh, currently, uh, we measure activity at airports uh, usually two ways. One is uh, passengers, obviously, commercial passengers that we put through the terminal. The other is aircraft operations. Uh, operation is a landing and or a takeoff. So when you see uh, 47,000 operations, that means we've had 47,000 landings and takeoffs uh, combined added together at our facility, which isn't a lot. Uh, for an airport our size uh, with a runway the length uh, that we have, which is about 11,000 feet. And, uh, you know, I came from Florida, as you heard, and ran some general aviation airports. I had one general aviation airport that was running about 240,000 annual operations uh, at that particular facility. So um, we have plenty of capacity uh, to land and take off uh, aircraft at our facility. Plenty of growth opportunity without the need to expand and add additional runway facilities anywhere in, in the near term. Uh, it'll be a long way down the road before that would occur. Uh, major uses, commercial aviation, corporate aviation, uh, general aviation, military, uh, in and out of the airport from time to time. So we really cover all of the gamuts of uh, uh, the types of uses that you would see at, a, at an airport. Although we really do fill a niche here in the airport uh, or in the upstate from an aviation standpoint, uh, like our colleagues here in the upstate. We have a great facility in downtown Greenville Airport. We have another great facility in downtown Spartanburg Airport, which is getting a new terminal that's under construction. Uh, we've got uh, the SCTAC uh, facilities, uh, the old Donaldson Center. Uh, and so we all serve a great niche, and, and I think we'll continue to do that going forward and really try to work hand in hand and capitalize on each other's assets and, and not necessarily uh, try to compete for the same type of business as we move forward, and, and we think that's important. Uh, again, a single runway, 11,001 foot. Uh, we always like to do that in aviation, add a foot, so we can always say we're over 11,000 feet. And, uh, you know, just one of those items. A uh, little bit about air service, and a lot of folks don't realize, especially in the southeast, how large our community is in the upstate. So, you know, when we were going through and we talked to air carriers and we talk about population base and the opportunity to put people on airplanes, we always bring this up to them. And, and uh, Greenville, Spartanburg, uh, and, and the upstate, that our region is, is up at the top line there. And you can see in 2008, our, our MSA was about a little over 900,000 in population. Um, and then you look at some of these other cities, and I'll, I'll run across because I know you may not understand or, or realize what the three-letter identifiers are. You may be able to guess. Uh, you have Augusta up there. Then we have Columbia. We've got Charleston. We've got Chattanooga, uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, Mobile, Pensacola, Savannah, and Knoxville. Um, and so when you look at what a lot of people consider and may think in their mind are some larger cities 
and metropolitan areas than the upstate, you can see by this list that we top the list. So, uh, so we use this. Population base is important to developing air service, uh, and uh, so this is an, uh, an important slide as we go talk to airlines. Another one here, just market access. We've talked about uh, roadway access, ease of accessibility to the airport. Uh, we do believe we cover and serve a 10-county area here in the upstate, uh, and that's important to us. Uh, but you can also see the population base outside of that. You know, if you look, we talked about MSA being about 900,000. If you look at the 10-county area, it's about 1.2, 1.3 million. But you go out 100 miles, we're at 6.2 million in population because we start to touch Charlotte, obviously, and we start to touch the northeast side of Atlanta. Um, so when you really look at our ability to draw uh, and support uh, additional air service into our community, we have a great population base within that 100-mile radius. And, and really, this is one of the items that convinced Southwest Airlines, uh, and, and again, one of the items uh, that helped convince them to uh, put service here into the upstate is, is having that size of a population base within 100 miles of the airport. A uh, little bit about pass, uh, passenger traffic and what we've been up against. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of things here. You can see the, uh, the bar graph here. Back in 2005, those folks that were here uh, experienced independence air. That might have been good or bad, I don't know, uh, depending on how you flew them, but, but they did have cheap fares uh, back in 2005 uh, time frame. Uh, and you can see that the uh, traffic growth, the, what we call an employment, which is a boarding uh, on, uh, on an airplane, uh, grew to over 900,000. And then you can see what happened after that and what's continued to happen, which is really a falling off of air traffic uh, since that time. And that was really uh, coincided with the departure of Independence Air. Airfares went up. Uh, airlines started to have economic woes. We have started to have economic woes from a national economy standpoint. Airlines pulled seats out of the market. Uh, as with anything in business, supply and demand. Uh, supply went down, demand was still up, prices went up, uh, we saw less travel, prices were cheaper in Charlotte and Atlanta, people would drive to Charlotte and Atlanta. Um, and so a, a dynamic that we were very much uh, wanting to try to uh, change as we continue to move forward. And really the only way to do that was to bring back a low cost carrier into the market that helped have a, a downward pressure or put downward pressure on airfares in our market from all of the existing incumbent airlines. We also have looked at some employment forecasts going out, and this really dovetails into our terminal program a little bit, but I thought this would maybe be a better place to talk about this, uh, this chart. Again, maybe a little difficult to see, but we did three forecasts uh, looking out, as, as you can see, out to 2050. Uh, and trying to see where we would be. And one was on a base case forecast, which essentially was about 2.5% annual growth in passenger employments at the airport over the duration of that time. Uh, then we had a low fare carrier scenario, and this was ever before Southwest actually announced service, but we, we thought we were going to have success, or, or at least we were going to convince ourselves we were going to have success by at least doing a forecast that showed it. Um, and uh, so uh, we forecasted based on having a low fare carrier in our market. Uh, and then we went to one step further and said, well, if that low fare carrier actually created a small hubbing operation at our airport, what would that mean to traffic growth in the future? Uh, and so you can see the numbers, and, and they, they obviously vary widely. As we all know, compounding growth, uh, even though we're not seeing it necessarily today in our investment portfolio out there because the interest rate is very low, uh, you know, when you have two and a half to uh, five percent or seven and a half percent growth over time, it really does uh, grow into something that uh, a fairly becomes a fairly large number. We focus for everything we've doing going forward on the uh, the 2040 uh, low fare bar. So the blue bar in the center uh, bars is the number that we really pick to target our future development and what we were going to focus on, and that's about 2 million employments. Um, you know, you saw we were at about 900,000 back in 05. We've dropped to 650,000 employments uh, roughly again over that uh, the last four or five years. But we think uh, the right target for us is to plan for uh, 2 million employments uh, out in that 2040 time frame. A um, little bit about destinations right now. Uh, 46 destinations, 17 cities. You can see them all here. Actually great air service uh, for a community our size. In fact, if I go to this, uh, I won't go, we'll go through all the listing because uh, you can see them up here. But if you go to the next, oh, let me, I guess it might be my next slide. 
Uh, and this is on seven commercial carriers today. Uh, some of these are combining up, as you know. You still see Northwest up on this list. They've merged with Delta, but these were numbers for 2009 uh, time frame year end. We've got now uh, U.S. or Continental and United uh, that have uh, merged together. Uh, with United coming out with uh, with their name on that tail uh, eventually, and we'll probably see another uh, happen here down the road, another merger. But um, as you can see, uh, Delta today uh, has 27% of the market. If you add that with the Northwest activity, they're in the uh, low to mid 30s from a market share standpoint, um, and that's important as I talk about what. Southwest is bringing to the table to understand that today Delta is our largest carrier with with 34 percent of the market. Allegiant uh, has played and continues to play a very important role at GSP in providing low cost air service, low fare air service to Florida. But they are a niche carrier; they only fly to Florida. Um, and uh, and while we value that service from them greatly, uh, it is limited and provides limited competition against the other airlines that operate in and out of GSP. So it's important for us to go out and get a carrier that had a broader network uh, that they flew uh, in the industry. This was a slide I thought was coming up next, and, and this kind of dovetails into that 17 cities that we already serve. If you look at our top 25, what we call origin and destination markets out of GSP to around the country. This is a list of those cities. And again, these are our airport identifier codes. Uh, but if you really look at that top 20, the big ones that we're missing today that people may want to go to are Hartford, Boston, Las Vegas, uh, Providence, LAX, Denver, as an example. But everything that's highlighted in, level, in yellow, we have nonstop service to today. So if you really look at this list, we're doing pretty well. And, and with the addition of Southwest, uh, we're even going to do better as we move forward in, in filling in some of these gaps uh, uh, here in the future. So, uh, so we feel pretty good about where we're at, but we know we need to get more competitive price-wise. And, and, and that's probably the biggest key here. A uh, little bit about leakage. I talked about this earlier. High airfares results in leakage. We leak 60-plus percent of our market between Charlotte and Atlanta. Um, you know, that equates, if you take some of the numbers I talked about, and I'll use more round numbers, a million in MSA, if you look at on a national basis, uh, on a per capita basis, uh, people travel about 1.4 trips uh, by air a year. So that means we should be doing about 1.4 million employments if we use that average. Probably should be doing a little bit more here in the upstate because of the amount of businesses we have in the upstate and business travel. Uh, but let's say it's 1.4 million. We're doing 650,000. Yeah, yeah, we got a pretty big gap that we can fill. We're always going to leak some level of traffic. I mean, there's going to be folks um, that want to make sure they don't have to worry about a connecting flight that are going to drive to Charlotte or maybe drive to Atlanta. Good on the international side. They don't want to make sure they don't miss that international connection, so they, they drive to those locations. So I think we will always leak somewhere in the 15 to 20 percent of our market, even at best of times. But that still means we should be doing well over a million employments today without any additional growth out of the airport. So, uh, so which is exciting to know that we have that opportunity in front of us to be able to capture that market. Love is coming to GSP. Love's coming to the Upstate. As uh, those of you that uh, have uh, obviously, uh, if, if you haven't seen this, um, I don't know where you've been, uh, because it's been all over the news here for a while. Uh, we had a huge event on October 20th, and, and Southwest is in town and brought an aircraft to town, and we had a great event and, and had a huge outpouring of uh, folks in the community that came out to spend that time with us. Again, made that announcement October 20th that they will start service on March 13th. Five cities uh, that they are going to serve, Baltimore, Washington, uh, Chicago Midway, Nashville, Houston, and uh, Orlando. Uh, we're very excited about all those cities and the opportunities for connections through those cities as we move forward. Southwest is known uh, as well uh, for their one-stop service, no change of planes, so you'll see some of that occurring as we move forward that will give you the ability to stay on the plane, not have to worry about a lost bag or not have to worry about uh, changing planes. People will have to get used to Southwest because it is different. Those of you that have flown Southwest uh, know this. Um, they have no assigned seating. 
Um, so you have to get uh, in a boarding group and you've got to get in there early. So it means 24 hours in advance, uh, be online, uh, checking in, get your boarding uh, card uh, assignment and make sure uh, if at all possible you're in the A group or the front part of the B group uh, to be able to get the seat that you want on the airplane because it is a free, uh, basically a free for all for seating um, on their airplanes. Um, the other thing is, is you can only uh, buy tickets on southwest.com. So you can't go to Travelocity, you know, you can't go to Expedia, you can't go to any of those other uh, internet sites in order to be able to get Southwest tickets. You have to go to <laughs> southwest.com. Uh, and uh, so, you know, just keep that in mind as, as you're out there searching for airfares once uh, either now, now that obviously uh, tickets are already for sale on Southwest, don't forget to, to check Southwest if you're going somewhere after uh, March 13th. Uh, they will be flying uh, Boeing 737 aircraft. Uh, this is a what we call a mainline aircraft in the industry versus regional jets, which we have most of today uh, flying in and out of GSP. Uh, we have mostly 50-seat regional jets uh, flying out of GSP with Delta and U.S. Airways and the other carriers, uh, and uh, with some 70-seat jets and some 90-seat jets, but most are 50-seat. And my point earlier about Delta being the largest carrier today at the airport uh, will soon not be true. Um, at least by a seat capacity standpoint, because when Southwest starts on March 13th with seven flights a day, uh, they will have 350,000 seats, annual seats in the market, um, in and out of uh, GSP. Today, Delta has about 325,000 seats in the market. Um, and all of that is size of aircraft and number of seats on the airplane. So, uh, so by uh, pure seats, uh, Southwest will become the, we believe, the, the leader at the airport from a market share standpoint in short order. Um, one thing, you know, that we know with Southwest, if we look around the country, uh, when they come in, fares go down. Uh, you know, just really quick, uh, a year or so ago, our fares, when we did a lot of analyses, were average fare was $377 round trip by DOT statistics, Department of Transportation statistics. Uh, and when we looked at cities of similar size to GSP that had Southwest service, uh, those average fares were about $100 less on average. Uh, that equates at that time when we were having about 700,000 people board airplanes out of GSP, if they all saved $100 a piece, that's $70 million a year in savings. So huge savings by Southwest coming into the market and helping to lower airfares in our community. Um, and then the biggest thing here is this wouldn't have happened without the kind of support we received from the upstate. Uh, I came to the airport in, in July of 2009, uh, kind of at the, I'm going to say, the front to middle part of this courtship for Southwest Airlines and uh, got handed to me, we need to get this deal closed, we need to get Southwest here, you need to do what you can to make this happen. Um, and the support that I received from the community across the board was just uh, tremendous. I, I've never seen a community pull it together again like the upstate did in, in supporting me, supporting GSP, and understanding the value of air service uh, to future economic development and, and positive economic development here in the upstate and quality of life here in the upstate long term. So, so uh, great to have that recognition and we just want to continue to ride this wave and this momentum as we move forward uh, to continue to provide uh, to the upstate the best aviation facilities and air services that we can, we can provide as, a, uh, as an airport commission. Uh, just real quick on marketing, we kind of hit the gamut, although I will say that we haven't been out there as much as I think we need to be on the marketing front, whether it's billboard, print, TV, radio, et cetera. You'll see us uh, becoming more and more involved in those things in the community and, and, and marketing things, uh, cultural events, uh, other things that we'll be out doing some of those events as well um, as we move forward. Uh, we will be putting in effect some frequent traveler programs. We've just put in a new parking revenue control system, so we're going to be rolling out some frequent park it pro, excuse me, parker program, uh, uh, hopefully sometime after the first of the year that uh, incentivizes people to, to, uh, to come out and use the airport and gives them a benefit for doing so uh, from our standpoint as the airport. We do provide incentives. Long story short is, you know, this is just a sample. Um, for a carrier that started service to a new nonstop destination, if I had a carrier come to me today and say, I want to fly from here to Los Angeles, 
we would more than likely say, okay, we'll give you $150,000 in marketing money. We'll waive all your rents and fees for one year. We'll help you with maybe some facility build out in order to get you into the airport and get you started and going to offset some of your startup costs. So we really do a lot as the airport uh, uh, in order to uh, try to secure traffic. This can very easily for a carrier that might run two regional jets to two new markets would equate to uh, the better part of uh, six or seven hundred thousand dollars a year uh, in waive fees uh, in addition to the hundred and fifty dollars or fifty thousand dollars that we would provide in marketing incentives. Uh, future terminal development, how am I doing here? Okay, I got ten minutes. Uh, we go through some phases of uh, evaluation when we um, uh, do planning at airports. Uh, and we start with a big airport master plan update. Well, we have to do that based on Federal Aviation Administration regulations because that allows us to apply for grant money out of a specific airport improvement program uh, that uh, exists at the federal government level. Uh, so we do that usually every five to seven years. Big picture, we look at the entire facility, we look at operations, we look at passengers, we look at runway and airfield development, taxiways, we look at cargo, we look at the terminal itself. Uh, and then what we usually do from that plan is then we get into more specific detailed studies, which you see here is number two in this case, which was a terminal area study that we just have completed here recently, reevaluating the terminal facility at the airport and where we needed to go for the future. And then from that, we'll move into schematic design, construction documents. Um, obviously, we'll bid it, we'll build it, and then we'll finish the project. So that's our kind of normal mode of operation at the airport. Uh, our terminal study focused on really three key items. One, uh, we wanted to correct current functional and, and anticipated future functional deficiencies in the terminal facility. Again, this building, the core of the building in particular, was built in, in 1961, opened in 1962, uh, and uh, it is all the original building in many parts. Uh, you know, it, it has not been really, while you've seen some bathroom facelifts and maybe some ticket counter facelifts and carpet changes, there really hasn't been any major structural things done in that core of the terminal. Uh, there was in 1989, the upper level boarding areas were built along with the uh, restaurant area that goes out onto the garden. Uh, but the core, original core of the building is pretty much as it existed back in 62. And there are some deficiencies, especially with the advent of 9-11 that I'll talk about a little bit. Sustainability lead integration, big for us as we move forward. We want to be green. Uh, you know, all these terms are sometimes I think overused, but the bottom line is, uh, anywhere where it pencils out on an ROI for us to do sustainable green lead type initiatives, we will do as we move forward, and I'll touch on a few of those. And then the third item is we do want to do some archi architectural and customer service enhancements to the building. Uh, you know, the upstate has changed over the last 50 years. Uh, 50 years ago, obviously, there was a lot of textile. Uh, business here in the upstate still is some, but now we're also high tech, we're automotive. Uh, uh, there is a beauty in the upstate that we don't, we, why we reflect that beauty as we talked about on the landscaping coming in, we don't necessarily reflect that beauty in the terminal facility itself. So it's a little, little kind of a hard kind of concrete facility that we want to try to soften up a little bit and reflect a sense of the community here in the upstate. Um, I'm going to run quickly uh, in, just to show you that, again, that logical process. Uh, this was a master plan back in 2003, and these were things that our master plan consultant at that time identified as items we needed to address. Ticketing lobby reconfiguration due to dealing with technology and things moving forward. We need to centralize and automate baggage systems. We need to centralize our security checkpoint. We needed to move our concessions from a pre-security location to a post-security in this uh, post 9-11 era where, where the uh, dynamics have changed on how passengers want to uh, uh, kind of integrate and, and uh, uh, interact with our facilities and connect the A and the B concourses which are not connected today uh, which provides us some ability from a concession standpoint to do some more things. I'm going to run through this real quick, just highlight some areas where we talked about insufficient queuing, constrained baggage area behind the facility, uh, behind the ticketing area. We have multiple level changes in the facility today, which uh, causes issues with slip and falls on occasion and other things and makes it sometimes a little confusing for the passenger as to where they need to go. Primary food and beverage concessions are at land side, not at air side. That's something we talked about we need to fix. 
We have two screening checkpoints today um, at the airport, in, inefficient and uh, from a standpoint, from a Transportation Security Administration standpoint, but also inefficient from an airport standpoint, just having those split. We really need to get that consolidated together. And again, there's no physical connection between the A and the B concourse. What we identified basically again is the major problems are with the original core of the terminal, and that's what we focused on. Uh, and just a couple of recaps, tight ticketing hall, passenger screening, we're not able to fully implement some of the uh, homeland security uh, technology that's, that's the newest stuff. That doesn't mean we're not secure. That doesn't mean we don't have good security. There are just some things we could do better than we do today by providing some business lanes and, and other things for the, for the business traveler to get through. We just don't have the physical space to be able to do those at the security checkpoint location. We want more variety of concessions, our heating and air conditioning. Most of the core of, uh, uh, mechanical systems at the terminal are vintage, uh, 1962 uh, equipment that our, that our staff has maintained extremely well, but by today's standards, obviously woefully inefficient. Uh, so we need to fix that. We have plumbing and electrical systems that are outdated. Lighting needs to be updated. Uh, additional elevators for uh, disabled uh, folks. We only have one set of elevators to get you from the current uh, ticketing area and land side up to the second level, uh, which isn't enough. If that elevator goes down, we're kind of stuck um, in how we move disabled passengers. Update our communications equipment. Want to make it more energy efficient. Baggage valets, those of you that know you set that bag down at the end of the jet bridge and, you know, the airline has to kind of throw it over the jet bridge to get it down to the uh, down to the ramp in order to get it on the airplane. There's lifts that you can install to, that, that helps both the passenger and the airlines. We're focused on future expandability uh, and operational cost savings to the airlines. We want to make sure whatever we do at the end of the day, we are helping to do things that uh, uh, minimize airline operational costs that will help us continue to grow air service. We want to do workstations at every gate, seating varieties, children's play area. As you can see, I'm going to not take time to go to all of these. There are a lot of things we're looking at in the terminal that we think are very important as a part of this project. Uh, again, focused on 2 million employments. That's what we're trying to get to. Uh, and we really base that on the fact that today we have nine gates, loading bridges on Concourse A. Uh, we can mirror image that by expanding Concourse B uh, by four gates. Uh, and from a gate capacity standpoint, those gates, 18 gates or so, will support 2 million employments. And so then we work back from there into the rest of the facility to say, okay, how do we make sure the rest of the facility will function to support 2 million employments as well? Uh, talked about lead sustainability. I'll hit some high notes. Uh, we're going to look at geothermal uh, for HVAC as we move forward and uh, see if that uh, will uh, play out. We're looking at high-performance envelopes, rainwater harvesting systems, solar hot water, solar photovoltaics, although we probably won't put that in right away because we don't get the tax benefit that private sector gets uh, as being a, uh, a public sector organization, but we'll at least get the terminal ready for solar vo photovoltaics. Uh, daylighting in the terminals, um, you know, demand control ventilation, uh, uh, just things, again, to be sensitive to energy, water consumption. Uh, we'll look at when we go through the construction of trying to target materials that we can acquire within a 500 mile radius of the airport to make sure we're not having a lot of stuff having to be trucked in over the road on long distances. Uh, you know, obviously burning fossil fuel to do that. So we're gonna look at, at what kind of materials we can uh, use for the construction side as well as a part of this. Um, Concessions planning program, I'm not going to, I think I touched enough on this, uh, just in some of the things we're trying to do. We're good on parking uh, till 2015, 2016, depending on how Southwest does. Uh, so I won't spend a lot of time on that because I want to get to quickly here because since I'm running out of time. Uh, we looked at about 15 to 20 different high level options, got down to five. And the range of these options, as you can see, uh, for three of them was right around $100 million. One was around $63 million for just kind of, a, uh, I'd say, a minor renovation. It was major, major renovation, but it was a renovation, not a reconstruction project of the terminal. Um, and three or $400 million to build a brand new facility. And the dates that you see out on the right is where we thought each of those projects would take us from a capacity standpoint. So uh, like the first three would take us out to 2040. In the case of the $63 million project, would only get us to 2020. Um, our commission focused on option 1A, uh, which was the top one, roughly $100 million. We're still tweaking the project. It's very much 
conceptual in nature. We're just moving into schematic design. Uh, but this gives you an idea, and it probably doesn't look much different from what you'd see today in how we're going to develop the airport. But this gives you a little bit of a site plan. Um, the terminal itself, what we're trying to do is move passengers from level one to level three, and those are really going to be the two levels I'll, I'll touch on. I'm not really going to spend a lot of time here because a lot of this happens to be back of house items. But what we have today when we talked about those multiple level movements, consolidating security checkpoint for passengers, and consolidating concessions, really needs to all happen on a third level. Um, and that would be at the same level as the existing concourse floor. So that's the goal of the project, is to try to get people from first level to a third level through a centralized security checkpoint that you see here, um, and then into a concessions hall where they could then go to uh, either concourse A or concourse B. Still a lot of work to be done. We've got 12 months in design uh, that will really kick off in earnest in January uh, in order to get this project uh, moving, but uh, we, uh, uh, we're very excited about the opportunity. Here's a rendering. Uh, it won't look like this, I guarantee you. <laughs> but if I have to throw a picture up here of, of what some of the thought process in, and you can just see some of the thinking as to the change and the feeling of the terminal in bringing wood and stone and things of the upstate into this facility as we move forward. So it's going to be an exciting time. Um, we've talked about a lot of this. Uh, phase one will be 84 to $90 million is, is our guess at this point. I would like to note, because uh, I think this is important, uh, no local tax dollars go into the airport for the operation and or the capital development of the airport. This project will be funded solely, uh, basically on a 70-30 basis, 30% grant money out of traditional airport grant funding sources from the federal government. The other 70% will be self-funded by the airport commission. No debt. We're not taking on any debt for this project. And no passenger facility charges, which sometimes you'll see if you book obviously through places like Atlanta that they have a passenger facility charge, we're not going to do that. Um, I'm going to skip this one. Schedule, uh, four years, five years probably overall for the project, 12 months in design, 36 to 42 months in construction, phase construction. Logistically, going to be a very difficult project. There will be some pain. Uh, during this project uh, because we are essentially doing open heart surgery and taking the heart of the terminal out and they have to stay in full operation during the time that we're doing that. So it's going to be, uh, I say fun, um, some may say I'm a masochist in that regard. So, <laughs> But uh, I have, I know, Russ, we are short. Um, if we have a few minutes, I'd love to show a, a, like a three-minute video if people have time to stay. If not, I can stop. Is that okay? Uh, let me... I don't see if I can get this thing to work. Let me come over here real quick. This is a uh, 3D uh, animation um, of the proposed terminal. And I'll give you a little idea of uh, what we're looking at. This is an existing facility, and you'll see the roof line kind of pop up on this as to what the full build out of the terminal might look like. And then we're going to give you a little round, uh, fly around perspective. Uh, of this, and I wish I could speed this part up a little bit, but it is, you know, I have my limitations on the technology. Um, but a lot of what you see today from, uh, again, a, a landscape, a, a feeling of the airport, you know, we're trying to maintain because we think there are so many things that have been done extremely well. Most of what we're tr really trying to fix here is internal deficiencies that have, again, occurred since that 9-11 uh, time frame and, and the way the industry operates and the way we need to operate and uh, trying to make sure that ultimately we have uh, the flexibility to accommodate changes in the industry uh, over the next uh, 30 or so years. Uh, you're going to come uh, here in a second. This is going to come down uh, the ultimate uh, in-plane, deplane drive as you're coming into the terminal. One of the things we want to do, you see the covered walkways. They don't exist today. Those are things that we think are important from a customer service standpoint, more canopying out front so you're not out in the inclement weather. You can walk over to the uh, parking garages on a, on a covered, uh, under a covered walkway. Uh, coming into the uh, uh, curbside area, again, you see that uh, canopy system. Uh, inside the terminal, this is very vanilla, so there is no real architecture in this at all. It's really just, again, trying to show uh, some uh, opportunities of, of what it uh, 
uh, might look like from a very vanilla standpoint. Technology at the ticket counters, you come away from the ticketing uh, and you would come up these vertical transportation cores uh, that would take you to a third level, uh, both escalators and elevators, so we'd have redundancy to get you, which we don't have today uh, necessarily as we talked about in the case of the elevator system. You'd, uh, the glass out front would enable you to look out over the landscape. We think it's important bringing that outside into the terminal uh, as we move forward from that security checkpoint location. Uh, this gives you a little view of the queuing line, which because we don't want these. We probably shouldn't have shown all these people in there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, you come out of security checkpoint and you would immediately come into a concessions area. Uh, uh, a big part of what we want to do from a concession standpoint is, uh, and I heard somebody talk about they wanted to maybe talk about the airport at some point, we want to bring local brands, local flavor into the airport. We think that's important. There has to be a mix of national and local flavor. Uh, we think that's very, very important for the airport moving forward. It uh, gives you a little, we're still going to maintain the garden um, outside, uh, so you would get to see that uh, from this third level. This again gives you that little perspective of that concession area and now the gate hold rooms, which in large part will get a facelift, but you won't see some, you know, extreme, you know, significant changes at that airside facility. Uh, land side and bag claim, there will be, again, that facelift with a, a much different look to the baggage claim facility as we move forward, uh, going to these slope plate devices, which provide us with more capacity rather than the flat plate devices that you see today. Um, so that gives you a little idea of what hopefully is coming in the future. Uh, we appreciate all your support uh, that you've provided to date. We appreciate all of you that continue to utilize GSP uh, as your airport of choice. Uh, we do understand sometimes financially that's not always possible, but we all hope that in March of next year that's going to change significantly and we'll see more of your faces out at the airport. And with that, uh, I know I've taken all the time. If anybody wants to ask questions, I'm happy to stay around for a few minutes for those that may want to chat. Uh, and I'm going to turn it back to Russ. Thank, Thank you very you much.